on topic. Oh, I'll kick off. So I don't think we can get anyone else in. Uh, yeah, bang on time. Okay. So I said I'd come back to talking about wave guys. Ah, one more staunch supporter. It's like a political link. So this is what my political rallies are like. <laughs> All right. So I said I'd come back to uh, wave guides. And actually, it kind of makes a bit of sense this way around, uh, anyway. Um, we were talking about transmitting power from one place to another. So we already saw that synchrotron radiation are sources. Okay, and I've put some videos online about a lot of this stuff. Um, I've put some stuff on about, um, about uh, taking apart your microwave oven. Microwave ovens are really handy for understanding how this stuff works. And there's, a, there's an article about how the microwave oven works, which is a contrast to what I'm going to show you here, because microwave ovens do not have modes and we're going to be talking about modes here. But the function of a microwave oven and uh, the components inside it are very instructive from respect this, this whole this whole subject. Okay? And remember our basic idea here about waveguides was the idea is to transmit power from one place to another so that you don't get this fall as 1 over r squared. Okay? Now we're a little restricted in time, so I'm going to go through the handwritten notes, the type notes, obviously go through more stuff in more detail. Now, when Oliver Lodge did his did his uh, his initial experiments. Remember, he used a conducting cylinder, and the conducting cylinder is different to what we saw in the last lecture about transmission lines, because the conducting cylinder has a single conducting surface, whereas a transmission line has two. Right? And what Lord Rayleigh noticed a few years later is that there's actually a minimum frequency down uh, uh, for which radiation can be transmitted through the conducting pipe. There is a cutoff. Okay? Above the cutoff, above this frequency, the cutoff frequency, the radiation is transmitted and below it it is not. And you can maybe already see that there's something to do with the wavelength. Somehow the wavelength has to fit inside the pipe. That's the basic idea. Okay? Now, in 1936, it was Barrow and Southworth who did some experiments where they built, started building very long pieces of tubing which they used to transmit this radio frequency energy. And of course this became incredibly useful during the Second World War because <coughs> radar transmitters and obviously high frequency TV transmitters all use waveguide to transmit energy around them. And these things can be tens to hundreds of meters in length. Okay? Um, here is a piece, a short piece, ignore the, the dial at the top, this is like a, a demo piece. I'm going to hand it around your quiz question it's conducting all around, it's just made of any old metal. <coughs> you find them made of brass, steel, copper. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Different things like that. Quick question is what wavelengths will fit down the pipe? And why is it rectangular? That's the question for today. Okay? What Baron Southworth showed is that at sufficiently high frequency, although the attenuation depends upon the distance traveled, not 1 over r squared, okay? you found that the attenuation you get at a sufficiently high frequency is much, much less than you get down a coaxial line, which is a sort of competing, that's the transmission line alternative, right? So for low frequencies, you would need a big waveguide, so that's no good, so you have to use coaxial. And at high frequencies, you have a small wavelength, and you can use a waveguide, and waveguides give you less attenuation. So that's the basic message, okay? So a waveguide is better for high frequencies. So that's our rough, Summary. Okay. The wavelength of the radiation has to fit inside that conducting box, and the, and the power is transmitted along the box. And we can imagine <coughs> that the that any radiation which is going sideways must be being reflected. There's a boundary condition on the surfaces of the box which is reflecting the radiation back in. But we do imagine there are electric fields and magnetic fields being generated. So it's a little bit like a transmission line, except now there are sides to the box. So clearly those sides, in order to carry an electric field elsewhere, there must be no electric field along the sides. Okay? The question is, which sides? Is it the long ones or the short ones? And what we'll see is the short sides where there's no electric field in the dominant way we put power down. Okay? And to give you an idea of the frequencies, a typical frequency might be about 500 megahertz. That's a sort of order of magnitude. So your mobile phone transmitter is a bit higher than that, you get, you get smaller ones. That corresponds to a free space wavelength, and we're going to distinguish free space wavelengths from the wavelength inside the waveguide. They are different. Okay? The wavelength inside the wave waveguide can be completely different to the waveguide in free space. But once you've got it in there, okay, the free space wavelength 
of 60 centimetres, well, that's got to be comparable to the size of the box. Okay? You can probably guess it's going to be, there's going to be some kind of mode, and you're going to get a zero electric field on one side, and on the other side, that's half a wavelength. That's the dominant mode we're going to find. Okay? So, those are your two cases. We have a sort of one-dimensional object, the transmission line, where two or more conductors allow you to define a unique current and voltage on the two surfaces. With a waveguide, it's a two-dimensional structure. So generally speaking, there's nearly only one conductor, not always, but only one. You therefore cannot define a unique voltage or current at any particular position. Okay? You have to think about it in terms of these field equations, these oscillating fields. There are transient fields of currents being set up which then dissipate. Okay? We're first now going to look at the three-dimensional situation because it's instructive. It helps us understand the two-dimensional one better. A three-dimensional structure is simply a conducting box. So whereas in a waveguide, power will go down the tube, in a box it has conducting ends, and just like the size of a waveguide, the conducting ends will reflect the electromagnetic radiation falling upon them, reflect those waves, there will be nodes in the electric field, and you can trap the radiation inside. That's what your microwave is. It's a box that contains electromagnetic energy. Okay? There are photons bouncing around inside it. They're just long wavelength photons. So here's how we compare them. So above we show the waveguide, and we conventionally define the long edge as being B, and the short, short edge as A. And we'll see that B over A equals 2 in virtually every waveguide. We'll see why in a little bit. Okay. It's any conducting surface, but really there are other kinds of waveguides that can have anything which will reflect. Imagine if I have a shallow enough angle for the, for the wave coming close to that boundary, you can have internal reflection. Okay? So a dielectric can also work, and that's what an optical fibre is. So I'm going to talk about the conducting ones mainly, and the mostly conducting waveguides are rectangular, they can be round, they can be dielectric. So, a di so a fi uh, an optical fibre is a dielectric round waveguide. Okay? So we're going to take for simplicity that the conductivity of the surface is infinite, so there's no electric field inside the conductor. But now we're going to add, to begin with, a Two, bend, two ends, okay, and they're a distance d apart, so we're obviously not going to use c, because that's the speed of light. So on the surfaces, we can say our boundary conditions are that the parallel component of the electric field must be zero, and the perpendicular component of the magnetic field must be zero. Okay. And if we have waves inside, we imagine waves bouncing inside, within the waveguide, they must satisfy the wave equation. So any solution we have must be in the form of a standing wave, okay? So we can imagine that trapped radiation inside that cavity takes the form of photons of a certain wavelength traveling backwards and forwards, interfering in such a way that the electric fields at, the, at any surface are zero, the parallel component, and they form a standing wave, so we have a peak in the middle. So, if we consider that standing wave in any direction, I've indicated x, but it can be y or z, the mean value of the pointing vector from the forward going and backward going waves must add up to zero. Right? Now you can show that also by direct consideration of the electric and magnetic fields, but obviously it's pretty, it's pretty clear that's what's going on. Now, let's write down what they can look like. Now, this is going to, the notes will say it a little bit more clearly. You can write down a series of initially complicated looking expressions. This is the general form for the form of the electric field in each, of the in each of the directions, x, y, and z. So for each direction, you see x0, y0, and z0. Those are the directions, the x, y, and z directions. You have a time-varying component here, and then these causes and signs arise because of that standing wave condition. Okay? So the allowed kx, ky, and kz values must be such as to make the electric field fall to zero at the surfaces. Now, you may wonder why we have causes and signs. Is you arrange those causes and signs so you can also obtain those boundary conditions. Right? So, to have EX equals zero, right, EX equals zero, if we look closely, if you set, K, you have to have KX, KY, and KZ have the right form, you see them under here, such that the electric field falls to zero at Y equals zero and Y equals B and at z equals 0 and z equals d in the cavity. But otherwise, it can be finite. 
and for, you, have to, you can do the same again for the other directions. In order to satisfy those conditions, clearly I must have, you can see here, it's not 2 pi, it's pi, so that the wavelength in any particular direction must be half the size of the, sorry, must be twice the size of that, ca that cavity size, okay? So the wavelength must be 2a or 2b or 2d or some harmonic of that. So these n values must be integers, those are called the mode numbers, and at least two of them must be non-zero. Okay? So you can have these kz values be equal to zero, in which case there's no variation of the electric field. Okay? It's uniform across one of the directions of the cavity. So it goes sinusoidal in one way, it goes up and down, but when I go that way, it doesn't vary. Now, to satisfy the wave equation, the way to think about it is, is we can imagine the photons going around at some angle inside the cavity. They have some wavelength, which is proportional to the free space wavelength inside. Okay. So omega and k here are the free space values. Just imagine the photons bouncing around at some angle. But when I think about the component of that k value in each of the three directions, x, y, and z, they must add up as so. So that means that the only omegas I could have are ones where the kx, ky, and kz values satisfy the boundary conditions. And when I translate those into the, the, those nx, ny, and nz, remember these, these three values have to either be zero or be, a whole, or be an integer. Okay. Um, these are the so-called resonant frequencies of the cavity. Remember this is what's called, it's a rectangular box. So I have three mode numbers, one for each direction, and I have a discrete set of frequencies. I don't get to choose any frequency I like, I can only get the constructive interference, the standing wave, for particular values of omega. The lowest value of omega is when, for example, I set nz equals zero. I must have a finite value of nx and y, I'm gonna set one for each of those, otherwise the field vanishes everywhere, and it's not an interesting solution. And then, the minimum frequency, I can rewrite this as pi c, where c is the speed of light here, one over a squared plus one over b squared square rooted. And I've chosen here, this is the minimum frequency because I've chosen any nz equals zero for the smallest dimension. That's when I get the lowest frequency. So d is less than a, d is less than b. Okay. And the way I've written it here, a and b can be any values, but um, uh, normally b is twice the size of a in the waveguide. It doesn't really matter in the cavity. It doesn't matter which way around they are. They both have mode number one. So that is the lowest frequency with which, in which I can form a standing wave in the cavity. So let's write down explicitly what that actual field looks like. So we'll take our general expression above, and you'll have to look at that a couple of times to convince yourself of it. In the 0, 1, 1 mode, and notice in any examinations, I'm only going to ask you about the lowest mode. I'm going to show you how it works, but you're only going to be asked about the lowest mode to make it easier. This is what the lowest mode looks like in a 0, 1, 1 in a, in a rectangular cavity. Okay? So I have some magnitude for the electric field. It varies both in the y direction and the z direction as a half sine wave. So it's 4 to 0 at the boundaries, and y equals 0, y equals a, and z equals 0, and z equals d. But otherwise, it only points in one direction. Okay? It, points, uh, it points in x and 4 to 0 in y and in z. Okay? It has no no value at all in the other direction. The electric field always only points in one way in the lowest mode. And if I write down that form, I can obtain directly the magnetic fields, and I can show that the magnetic fields, the perpendicular component, falls to zero at the boundary. So the magnetic field at the surface is, can point along the surface, but it can't point into the surface. Yeah, the electric field can point into the surface, the magnetic field can't. Okay. Now, how does a waveguide differ? A waveguide differs and then there's no ends. Okay? It's a tube with holes at either end. Right? So there's our picture again. So now there's no ends bounding in the z direction. The power can come in and go out at either ends. So therefore there's no restriction on the kz value. I can choose any value I like. So that's the basic difference between a cavity and a waveguide. This is why we showed cavities to begin with. We have a standing wave in the cavity and we have a discrete set of frequencies and I can have a different numbers, different mode numbers, where I satisfy those boundary conditions. But I have only you know, one frequency here, one frequency there, and so on. The waveguide is different. There's still a cutoff. I still have to fit the wavelength down the waveguide. Right? 
But now, once I'm above that cutoff frequency, I can freely choose the wavelength in the z direction. So you can see here that I have discrete values for kx and ky. I can have any value for kz. And when I add them all together, they must still be equal to omega squared, omega squared over c squared. Okay? So as long as omega is large enough, then I can start to satisfy these discrete values for kx and ky, and then kz takes up whatever's left over. So kz is defined by omega squared, c, and, uh, omega squared or defined by omega, the frequency, and it's, and it's also determined by which mode I have, what values of kx and ky. So there's still a minimum frequency whereby I get a real kz value. Of course, a real kz value, KZ value means that power is going down the waveguide, okay? which is, of course, what I want. I want to transmit power from one end to the other. So instead of having discrete values, now what I have is I have the following. Okay? The frequency must be bigger than kx squared plus ky squared times a factor. So you can see, I've still got those mode numbers, m and n, but now there's only two of them. I don't have the third one. I don't have to define a unique frequency, I just have a frequency that's bigger than this value. And again, the overall, the overall wave number, so I imagine that as the waves are traveling down the waveguide, I've got two components forming a standing wave. They can be going at an angle to each other, and they interfere with each other, and they're bouncing off the walls, so that I satisfy that, I satisfy that boundary condition. As they interfere with each other, the wavelength they have in the free, the free space wavelength is different to the wavelength which I get from that interference going down the waveguide. So the wavelength along the waveguide is longer than the free space wavelength. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. You can see here, kz squared is smaller than k squared because I have a finite kx and ky. Because this number is smaller than that number, this wavelength is longer than that wavelength. Okay. So that's the dispersion relation in a waveguide. So you want to commit that to memory. You can write it in a number of ways. And this is just another way to write it down. That's also called the waveguide relation. And again, we only ever consider that M and N are either 0 or 1, okay, for simplicity. Because that's, those are the ones that are most useful, as we'll see in a minute. So that's your waveguide equation. So you can write it down in a variety of ways. And one way to say it is, imagine I have a certain frequency omega that I'm shoving down the waveguide. Okay. I, I have a particular mode numbers, m and n, and for that I get a certain kz value, and therefore a certain wavelength. And that's again, that's the wavelength along the, along the waveguide caused by the interference of the shorter wavelengths as they overlap. So the free space wavelength is shorter, the wavelength along the cavity because of that interference effect. Yeah. Okay, so now notice here that there's no there's no tying together of the wavelength of the wave, the free space wave, uh, that free space wave. There's no tying together that with the dimension of the waveguide. It just has to be short enough. So you can see that waveguide you've got there. There is, a, there is a maximum wavelength that will fit down here, but any wavelength smaller than that will get down here. And as the wavelengths get shorter, then basically the, those waves are now pointing more and more down the wavelength and interfering less and less. And, the, and the, uh, the, the free space wavelength becomes comparable to the, wave, to the wavelength in the waveguide. Now notice here, this can drop to zero. The wavelength can go to infinity. Right, so at the cutoff, the wavelength in the wavelength is infinite. In other words, an electric field applied at one end will immediately be apparent at the other. Okay. Doesn't quite get there. Now, this is our picture of how it looks. So kz is less than k, and remember the phase velocity of the wave going down the waveguide is simply omega over kz, which is clearly greater than c, like the plasma relation we saw before. The group velocity is d omega by dk, and that's clearly less than c, and explicitly one is one over the other, okay, with that factor of c on top. And you can see as you go towards cutoff, when the wavelength becomes matched to the size of the waveguide, vg drops to zero. So I cannot transfer information or power from one end to the other at the cutoff. So it implies that the speed um, obviously becomes, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, it is the speed that goes to zero. So here's our cartoon, you see? 
I imagine a free space wavelength and wave number bouncing off, and I can consider these wave fronts as interfering so that the free space wavelength between these wave fronts, okay, when, it, when they overlap and interfere, gives you a, an effective wavelength, which is sort of the distance between, say, here and here, which is longer. Right. Where was I? I didn't know it. Now, there's, a, there's an overall cutoff frequency. Yeah, okay. There's an overall cutoff frequency. Below a certain frequency, you can't get, um, can't get anything down the waveguide. But clearly for each mode, there is also a cutoff frequency. So each mode has a cutoff frequency. So the first mode is going to be 0, 1. The electric field points one way across the waveguide. So whatever the value of M and N, that's how many wavelengths, half wavelengths, are fitted inside the waveguide across each dimension, right? it has a cutoff frequency. So if I have a certain size of waveguide, and I gradually turn up the frequency that I'm trying to put down the waveguide, eventually I turn it up high enough that the very lowest mode will be excited, which is the 0, 1 mode. And that's the mode which sticks across where the electric field points across the short side. So let me get this, this piece. Okay. Well, sure we should be sat in front of you. Okay. So here's your wave mode. So that's B that way, and that's A that way. So the short side is A. Okay. The lowest mode, so I turn up the frequency, and the lowest mode is the electric field pointing that way, across the wave mode that way, not that way. In order to get it to point that way, I'm going to have to satisfy the boundary condition going that way, which is twice the frequency. Okay, so I turn up the frequency, and I start to so what's called exciting the mode. I can, foot, I can get power into it. Yeah? So below the cutoff frequency, no power goes down. I get the frequency high enough, and the power will start going down the waveguide, but only in that mode. So now I know which way the electric field is going to point. So as long as I keep the frequency between that cutoff and that cutoff, I know exactly where the electric field will be. If I go too high in frequency, then I can get any mode, I can start all sorts of modes, and I don't know which way the electric field is pointing, and I get all sorts of problems. It could interfere in such a way to get a large electric field, and I can get sparky, and I don't want that. Okay? So that's the reason why we control which mode we have, and the way we control it is by saying if I have a certain frequency, I now choose a certain size of waveguide. So the way I choose the size of waveguide is I need to choose the value of B. The value of B matches the frequency I'm using. So if I make A very, very small, then I, can, then I, and I change the frequency so I satisfy the waveguide condition in B, then the electric field points this way, then great, I keep A really, really small, and now I can turn the frequency up as high as I like, can't I? And you know, I, 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 it will take a long time before I start, start exciting that fundamental mode in the other direction. Why don't I just do that? Why don't I just have a really thin slot? Well, the answer, of course, is the amount of power that goes down the waveguide, you can imagine, is kind of proportional to the area. So if I increase A, I can get more power down for a certain, amount, for, for, uh, for a certain frequency. So what size of A do I choose? Well, I choose a value of A such that I have the largest amount of frequency tuning between when I excite that first fundamental mode and when I excite the next mode. So that's why, that's why waveguides are rectangular. So when you look at this waveguide, why is the ratio 2 to 1? It means I get about a factor of 2 tuning of the frequency. So I can, buy, I can make standard size waveguides, and this waveguide has a certain size, and it will work for any frequency above that cutoff, okay? and below, any below the frequency which gives me the next mode. So this waveguide, well, what's the wavelength? The wavelength there has got to fit down that to, that's what, about 3 centimeters? So the, so the cutoff is about six centimetre wavelength. So I can use any wavelength from six to three centimetres down this tube. Okay. Now you're going to work out what the frequency is, and you'll see it's about one point, uh, this one is three gigahertz wavelength. Okay. Work it out, check that right. Okay, now, so here is our lowest mode. So notice the lowest mode, zero, one, is very, very simple. You can see that the cutoff frequency only depends on the size of the long side, C over 2B. C, the speed of light, B, the long side of the waveguide. And we always choose A less than B conventionally. Some books will confuse you for that. Sometimes. So nothing travels down the waveguide below that frequency. So let's, 
Let's think of another waveguide. A 60 centimeter wide guide, that's a big waveguide at the size, quite commonly used in radar, has a cutoff frequency of 250 megahertz, right? That's actually quite high, but you know, that's sort of mobile phone frequencies, right? Mobile phone frequencies about a gigahertz. So you imagine the microwave transmitters on your mobile phone are going to be something like uh, four times that frequency, so the waveguide's going to be four times smaller. So there we are. So waveguides, mobile phone waveguides on the top of the transmitters, about double that size or thereabouts. So you can see that that's great if you've got gigahertz signals, like a mobile phone signal, you can use waveguide, but once you go down to 50 megahertz, you'd like to use a waveguide, because it doesn't lose any power as you transmit along it, but things, things are enormous. Okay, 100 megahertz waveguide is about this big, 50 megahertz just becomes absurd. It takes too much copper, too much metal to make it. Now, Let's look, at our mode. Let's look at the actual form of the electric field explicitly. So this is our 0-1 mode, that's the electric field going across. And you can see, it varies, the electric field varies as a function of x and a function of y. This is the general case for any m and n. But as we see, um, m is going to be 0, so this is a constant, and n is equal to 1, so we have a half sine wave okay, going across uh, as a function of y going across the b dimension yeah so y so y points that way and x points that way okay. draw a picture get try and draw a picture of it and i'll the, the the diagrams on the on the type notes i'll show in a minute so you can see in this case for m and n non-zero the electric fields in the x and y direction are non-zero in general and the, the magnetic the electric field in the z direction is actually zero because of that interference in the particular case of the lowest mode, n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 0. So you can see here that I get a sinusoidal variation of electric field along the long direction, but it's constant in the short direction. Okay. And also, ey0. The magnetic fields are more complicated. They form circles. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But importantly, when I, when I do del cross e equals db by dt to get the magnetic fields, I get a phase shift at 90 degrees between the magnetic field in the z direction and the magnetic field in the x direction. Don't worry too much, I'm just showing you what they actually look like. Okay? They do satisfy that magnetic field condition, it's going to be c times less than the electric field, and so on. Right? But the important thing here is bz is non-zero. So this is what's called a transverse electric field, a TE mode. Now I've only explained the TE modes, there are also TEM, there are TM modes and TEM modes. I'm just showing the simplest case. So there's lots and lots of these different modes which satisfy the boundary conditions. This is just one of them. Okay. If I wanted to sketch them out, they look like that. So I've tried to show it. I'm going to show you a photograph in a minute. Oh, sorry, not a photograph, a, a, a better, better time in a minute. So this is what the electric field looks like at any particular plane. So this is at a particular instant. Waves going that way. So this is a cross-section through the waveguide. There is B along the y direction, there's A along the x direction. And in our lowest mode, when n equals zero and n equals one, the electric field points across the short side. And it's stronger in the middle and weaker out the sides. And that's the electric field. Notice the electric field can point transiently into the surface on these two sides here, because I can form transient currents that can flow as the wave goes by. So as time goes by, the electric field goes up and down. I cannot have any electric field which is along the surfaces, but I can have an electric field which points out of the surface because of the generation of transient charges. However, on these boundaries across here, right, there's no electric field at all. The magnetic field is different. I cannot generate any magnetic field into the surface, but I can generate a magnetic field along the surface, and again you can imagine that that's being caused also by the flow of charges on the surface. So the magnetic field takes the form of little circles, more or less, that run along the surfaces. Again, this is just the TE, the TE mode. And if I imagine at any particular surface, let's look half a wavelength further along, if I imagine the magnetic field, magnetic field point at the, at, on that, along this direction, you can see it reverses inside, it goes clockwise here and anti-clockwise there, it must be pointing across that, that, uh, that plane, so the electric field points one way, the magnetic field, field, field points at right angles, so of course S equals in cross B, points down the wave curve. So power is going down the wave curve as a function of time. And like we saw for the free space situation, 
instantaneous power at any particular place goes up and down with time, and the power is carried from one place to the other. So this is at one instant. And you can see here that the wavelength along the waveguide is 2 pi over kz, which is generally speaking much, much bigger than the free space wavelength. So our basic conditions are the electric field has a strength that varies as a half sine wave across the long y direction, and so does the magnetic field. The difference is in the direction that it points. EY equals zero and BX equals zero in this lowest mode. E is perpendicular to B everywhere, as it ought to be, regardless of what the shape is going on. And E is perpendicular to the surface at the surface whenever it's non-zero. See, it points into the surfaces here, but it's zero at the sides. So that's how it works. That's all for the TEU modes. I'll show you a bit more accurately. Here is a better drawing. Okay. So these are the electric fields at any given instant. So I've, seen, I've shown cross-section through them. And these are the magnetic fields. You can see they form little circles. And you can see that they form sort of little plates of fields okay, pointed going around in circles. And they go around the surface because, of course, there are charges f uh, flowing in the surfaces as well, which are kind of helping to carry that, carry that magnetic field. Okay? And the magnetic field does go up and down as a function of, of position, and it has a half sine wave form. It's stronger here in the middle of B than it is at the ends. So obviously it's pointing that way. Right? So that magnetic field pointing that way it gradually rotates around and points down the waveguide in other places. You can see there is a component of the magnetic field that's pointing up and down the waveguide which isn't true for the electric field. So that's the lowest mode. Here is the next mode up, a TEO2. The difference here is now I have a full sine wave across B, but I still have no variation across A. That's the next one up. So that, that can only happen at a higher frequency. And for comparison, this is the TE10 mode. So that's TE01 and TE10. So you can see here, here the electric field points across the short side and here the electric field points across the, uh, the, lo the, uh, the long side. But otherwise it looks the same. The only difference is the frequency. It's the frequency which gives that electric field. So higher modes have more complex field shapes, but we only, you only need to worry about that one. That's, that's my, uh, it's my, gift, my Christmas gift. All right, so is that all clear enough so far? I know I heard a bit of a wrong. You have to read through the notes a little bit. So let's put some numbers on that. Let's look more closely. So this is one of the examples. So this is, oh, it's not far off this. Here we are. This is four centimeters across B, which is not far off that, and two centimeters across A. The cutoff frequency is about three and a half gigahertz, as we said. And we're plotting over a distance. So this is, this is about right. You can see this is something like 15 centimeters. So the electric field pattern at about three gigahertz in this waveguide, which you have, you would have hot spots at any given instant. You have hot spot electric field in different places. Now, it, clearly, if the electric field gets too big, you can get sparking. Particularly, if, I mean, many waveguides are filled with full of air, so you can get sparking in the air. So there must be a magnetic, uh, a maximum electric field that I can sustain the waveguide, right? Okay. And you can see that clearly, if it's a constant across there. The electric field doesn't vary as I change the size of the waveguide in this mode. But the chance of sparking is only dependent on the electric field in any particular place. So if I have a certain amount of power, the bigger the waveguide, sorry, if I've got a certain amount of power, the bigger the waveguide, the less electric field I have. So if I make the waveguide smaller, I can carry less power before I get sparking. That's why I want to make A as big as I can. But you can see I don't want to make it too big, I want it to be basically only as no more than half the size of B. That's why A is half the size of B. So let's calculate that properly. So that's a common question one might be asked. Let's calculate. So let's look at energy and power flow. Uh, so, with reference to our picture above. Uh, let's fold that over. Now, leave that. You, you, you know what that. So, in our transverse electric mode, what do we basically say? This the electric field points only one way across the short side. There is no Z component of the electric field. And BZ is 90 degrees out of phase with, all, with the, the field components in X and Y. That's, that's what we get when we calculate it. 
Calculate the, let's calculate the energy flow. The energy flow is just what it always is. It's E cross B times a factor. Right? So we can calculate this explicitly. The first thing we see quite clearly is you can imagine this in two ways. You can imagine it in terms of the, the interference, the standing wave condition. It must be true that there's no power that flows sideways uh, net. Okay? So the power flow uh, that way, that way and that way is zero. There's only power flowing that way. Let's calculate it. If you calculate it explicitly, it's proportional to the magnitudes of the electric field and magnetic field in general. We know the magnetic field is turned by the electric fields. Okay? And we know that in the, uh, in the TE, the lowest mode, one of those numbers is zero, isn't it? So what we're going to worry about is EX and BY. Okay? So we calculate it, we can show. Because BY is determined by EX, right? it must be proportional to the electric field squared, You've got a scaling factor, is mu naught, there's a scaling factor to do with coupling between by and the x. So it's k, so the power flow is equal to the wave number, that's when that's proportional to the wavelength, divided by some scaling factor to do with the frequency, but it basically is proportional to e naught squared, the electric field, times some variation because of course it's stronger in the middle than it is at the end. So you've got most of the power goes down the middle of the waveguide. I can write that in two ways. I can write it on the left, or I can write it down in terms of the group velocity. Obviously, the omega and k determine the group velocity, so I can write that factor in terms of the group velocity. So you can see here, look, when I write it this way round, and I take mu naught and c out, I can write it in terms of epsilon r, epsilon zero times electric field squared. So that's obviously the energy density, isn't it? So the energy density inside of the electric field, inside the waveguide, times how it actually spatially varies, it's stronger in the middle. That's basically how much power I've got in any particular location, and then it moves at the group velocity. So this obviously is telling me how much power is going down. So just the same as it is in the free space condition, the motion of power is simply proportional to the energy density times the speed. Simple, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Now let's work it out. The total power that goes down the waveguide well, I simply calculate what S is as a function of X and Y, and I integrate it over the side of the waveguide. Now, clearly, it doesn't vary with that. It only varies with B. And, of course, that, that's, that integral is half. So if that factor half appears, so, so the total power that goes down the waveguide is proportional to the area. Right? So if I want to get a certain amount of power down, and I don't want to spark by having too much E0, I want to maximize the area. Well, I don't get to choose B. So what I do is I have to vary A, I make A as big as I can, and A gets to be half the size of B. So that tells me the maximum power I can get down the waveguide. I need to set whatever my, I think I can get away with in terms of the electric field, and that's how much power I have. Right? We'll put some numbers on that in a second. Okay, that's what we need to look at. So, okay, so the first way we did it, let's just recap. So just to recap, I can calculate the, the, the pointing vector directly by knowing the electric and magnetic field. Remember, I wrote it down explicitly for that lowest mode. Therefore, it goes to E naught squared, which makes sense. It's an energy density. And I can show that the pointing vector can be written in terms of the energy density times the group velocity, explicitly. I can also work it out directly from the electric fields and the time variation, and I can relate the power flow to the electric field times the area. That's what, I, that's what I would expect. I can write it down equivalently in the same way. I can think about, it's the same expression really, isn't it? I can think about the energy density in the electric field and the magnetic field. Right? So I group them together in the previous expression. And again, integrating over A and B, I can work out what the energy density is at any particular location in terms of the electric field. It's just AB over 4 times that energy density. And that's a particular way of writing. That's the average energy density over some unit length of the guide. So I'm time averaging it. That's where those factors, that's where that factor of 4 comes from. So again, I get the same expression. The power that moves is equal to the energy density times the velocity with which the stuff is moving. Okay? MD times B. Okay, so there we go. So it's exactly the same as we had before, and I can write it in a variety of ways, 
either in terms of the energy density or in terms of the wave number or so on. Now let's look, let's compare that to what we had before. So let's compare that to, to our free space condition. So in our waveguide, the energy flow is in the z direction because of that standing wave condition. I have a field strength part which spatially varies inside the waveguide, so I have to take that into account. And then I have the group velocity and then a, an averaging factor over time. So I can write it down in terms of velocity times energy density. Now notice here that this is different to the free space condition. The group velocity varies as a function of frequency. As the frequency drops, so does the group velocity. So eventually the group velocity goes to zero. That's not true in the free space situation, of course. There's no variation of velocity with frequency. But the free space condition, which I'll back in there, the average value of the pointing vector is exactly the same expression. I've still got an energy density term from the electric field, and simply multiplied by the velocity, which in this case is C. But it's the same expression. So there we are. So those are my summary. That's the summary. So the, th the only one you need to you need to remember is the zero one mode. Remember that's the one where the electric field points across the short side. So it varies the half sine wave along the long direction, but at any particular distance, particular uh, position y along the long direction, as I vary x, the electric field does not change. It does not go up and down as I go across a. It just points right across. Right? So that's all you've got to remember. For later reference, we've only talked about the TE modes for which the electric field in the Z direction is zero. That's why it means transverse electric. There are other modes, TM and TEM. I'm not going to talk to you about Okay, but they are there. Okay, that's kind of it, really. Um, a couple more things we should really talk about. Let's talk about some practical wavelengths. Leave that up the time. I know it's been a bit of a run, but I think we've we've got there. So let's let's recap. I want to transmit some power from my source generator to my mobile phone transmitter. How am I going to do it? I can pick two basic components. I can pick a transmission line component, a coaxial cable, or I can pick a waveguide. Coaxial cable is probably cheap and made in really long cables, it's quite easy to wrap, right? but it's more lossy. I may choose to do that. I don't have to really that worry that much about the shape of it, I can compress it a little bit. With waveguide, I get more power flow, flow I get less loss, I can, do, I can set more power down it. Right? But it's harder to make, I need to make sure my dimensions are correct. Okay? And uh, um, So I have a crossover. And loosely speaking, a coaxial cable is practical for frequencies which are less than around 3 gigahertz. A typical attenuation, 3 dB is the way we describe it, that's our decibel notation. So 3 dB attenuation is half the power is gone. So typically, in 100 meters, you might lose half the power of 100 megahertz. So 100 megahertz signal. So you can imagine uh, something like a certain ra you know, radio transmitters. If I put 100 megahertz down a coaxial cable, I lose half the power in 100 meters, which is not so bad. However, at 1 gigahertz, it starts to become pretty bad. 10 dB is, is a quarter, uh, is a tenth of the power, right? Because it's 3 dB uh, to power 3. So I lose 10 decibels in 100 meters. So I lose most of my power in 100 meters. So if I have a long cable, like for example from the bottom to the top of a, of a, of a mobile phone transmitting mast, that could be 100 meters from the trans, from the you know from the, from some kind of relay station at the top, right? I could start losing quite a lot of power. That's no good. That's when I start to think about using waveguide. The typical reason why you get the attenuation is just heating. It's resistive losses in the dielectric of of the you know it's, it's all about the current flowing on in the, in the uh, dielectric conductors or the conductors themselves. And so those limits, the power I can get down, I might be able to get maybe a kilowatt into 100 megahertz or a couple of hundred watts at 2 gigahertz. Waveguide is different. So in waveguide, 
the basic issue here is of the cutoff frequency, and equivalently, I'm going to write it down, down another way, I can write it down in terms of the cutoff wavelength. So if I have M and N non-zero, I have a general expression, but you can see that the C disappears depending on, uh, C disappears um, when I go from frequency to wavelength. I should note that not all waveguides have either air or vacuum in them. If they fill with dielectric, I need to replace that C with the dielectric value. You can kind of appreciate that. So like I said, we make our waveguide rectangular so it can carry the largest range of frequencies. That's one thing I have to pick. And again, let's pick our, let's pick three centimeter radar. That's a frequency of 10 gigahertz. Now my waveguide will be smaller than that. And just calculate these numbers to show you can do it. If I have a, if I have a 10 gigahertz radar signal that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to uh, transmit, okay, if I pick a one centimeter by two centimeter waveguide, I am above the, the, the lowest mode cutoff, which is 7.5 gigahertz, which is great. My three centimeter wave will propagate down the waveguide. But the next two modes, which are F10 or F02, they're equal, aren't they? They're at 15 gigahertz, so they, they don't get excited. And the next one after that, F11, is at 17 gigahertz. That also doesn't get excited. Just show you can calculate those numbers for yourselves. Okay. Right. Let's calculate the wavelengths. So we said that Kz, which is the wave number in the waveguide, is smaller than the free space wave number. So this is the free space wave number, K. Okay. That's equal to O squared over T C squared, which is 2 pi over the free space wavelength lambda. And for the lowest mode only, right, it's only dependent, so n here is 1, and there's no m value, the, the, m, the m term is, is not in this expression. B is whatever the size of the waveguide is. Okay? So the wave number here, the kz wave number, is smaller than k, so the wavelength is longer. So let's look at that. K is 140 per meter, or 1.4 per centimeter. So the wavelength down the waveguide is 4.5 centimeters. So notice that's a lot bigger than three centimeters. The, wave, you know, the wavelength down the waveguide is much bigger than the free space wavelength. Free space wavelength is three centimeters. The wavelength in the waveguide is the lowest mode. In this particular case, depending on the size of the waveguide, about four and a half centimeters. What's the phase velocity? Well, the phase velocity is bigger than the speed of light, like so I just omega over kz about 4.5 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And the group velocity is still a healthy 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay. And remember, that tells you how the relationship between the electric field and the power flow down the waveguide is determined by Vg. So let's work that out for our waveguide, what the power limit is. Okay. So let's pick a number. Let's say it's limited by dielectric breakdown in the air, which is about 3 volts per millimeter. Seems like quite, quite much, why would it? Okay, three kilowatts per three, three, three thousand kilowatts per minute. That should be three volts per micron. So three volts per micron. Um, so let, let's be let's be uh, careful. Let's, let's set a limit for our electric field of fifteen hundred kilovolts per meter. Factor two safety. I don't want to, I don't want to be sparking. I don't want to be getting quite close to it. So if I calculate it, let's let's calculate what my power uh, what power I can get at an eight by sixteen millimeter waveguide. I've got a cutoff frequency of nine gigahertz in this case. That means I can. I typically use it between some way above that 9 gigahertz, say 12, right, so I can get a decent group velocity, but no more than 18, so I don't excite the next frequency up. And in that situation, I, get up, I can get up to 145 kilowatts. That's enormous, isn't it? So a 12 gigahertz signal, I get 150 kilowatts down the way. Oh, that's a lot. Way higher than coaxial. That's why they're useful. I can pump a lot of power into my radar or my mobile phone transmitter. So imagine a bigger waveguide, 34 by 72 millimeters. So that's obviously this little one is smaller than this one. This one's bigger. A bigger waveguide, obviously I get low frequency. This might be a mobile phone type frequency, or radar. Okay. I get maybe 2.8 mega, megawatts down. By the way, this size here, this is about the size of waveguide in microwave oven. Now it's hard to work out the attenuation. It depends on the conductor type. So this is a brass waveguide. I think you get me different metals. Clearly, it depends upon the conductivity. The power will typically drop um, by 1 over E in many tens of meters. So it's, it's not far off coaxial, the power loss, but I get more power down it. Okay. Right. Um, 
Now, just to finish off, there's two things I think you should have a look at. We're all, we're all done now. So two things to look at. The first one is read about uh, microwave ovens. Because when we talk about attenuation, and I put an example in the written notes that I'd like you to take a look at, and it's this example here, uh, which is, imagine I'm feeding power, uh, ah, it's in the other notes. Imagine I'm feeding power into a microwave oven cavity, and I ask myself, how long does the power persist in the cavity? There must be an effective Q value. I've right. it down a step so I can't find it. I must have an effective Q value. What determines the effective Q in the cavity? So I have a magnetron which feeds power out at about 2.5 gigahertz, and have a look at how they work. They work using cyclotron radiation. You make a magnetic field of 0.1 tesla, as we saw in the previous lecture, and that gives you a cyclotron frequency of about 2.5 gigahertz. You send the power into a wave blade. So this is your microwave oven. The back of the microwave oven, there is a magnetron. I put some videos online that show how it works. Please watch them. They're, they're, you'll find them fun, especially when they turn into a ray gun. Well, we'll be Christmas watching. You have a waveguide, and you can see that here for, for a couple of, couple of gigahertz, the waveguide is going to be a few centimetres across, maybe six or seven. So that's what's in the back of the microwave oven. And it connects the magnetron to the cavity. They're not directly connected, there's an antenna in each of them, and then they couple together. So one radiates into the other. They don't form a proper standing wave if you connect the things together. You have to, you have to perturbatively couple them. You now feed power into the microwave oven cavity, which is many times the wavelength. So this is no longer a standing wave, it's what's called a multi-mode cavity. So there's power flow all the way around in different directions, but it doesn't matter because the electric field's not so high. We're not, we're not pumping megawatts into our chicken or a cup of tea. Okay. So that's handy because it means you get even cooking of your food. Right. To work out the Q value, all you're going to do is work out the volume of the cavity divided by the skin depth, delta. The skin depth is how much power is being lost in the walls, and the volume is, uh, is, is how much power is not being lost. So the ratio between the surface, so the surface area times the skin depth, that's the amount of volume into which power is being lost. So V over S delta, the Q value is proportional to that. That's how that works. Trying to calculate the Q value of the micro oven, you'll see it's less than a millisecond. So between the time you turn off the power and you open the door, all the power has been dissipated into the conducting walls because of the skin depth. So that's, the, that's fact number one I'd like to look at. The other thing to look at is fiber optics. And I'd just like you to take a look at fiber optics. This is the only this is this is a uh, um, this is the relationship between the conducting picture and the dielectric picture. The only difference here is that a dielectric waveguide, like an optical fiber, relies on the fact that the waves are bouncing at a very shallow angle at the edge of some, some glass material. Okay. So the way it works is you have a lower refractive index on this cladding, as it's called, compared to the core. So the signals carry down the core are tiny, it's a few microns across. So when you, when you see an optical fiber, most of what you're seeing it's actually not even the cladding, it's a thing called a buffer or jacket around the outside. So the glass thing you pick up that's a millimetre across has got two things inside it. It's got a cladding, it's about a tenth of a millimetre, and that basically captures the evanescent wave, remember we talked about that, that's what's happening there. The actual signal is going down the centre, and the whole thing works because you're getting internal reflection between that two boundaries of N2 and N1. So therefore, you must obviously set the wavelength and the refractive indices and the angle, that's right, and, and, the, and the size of, the, of, the, of that core, so that you get the right kind of angles of those interfering waves that form in the standing wave down the wave curve. Everything else is kind of the same. Right? Except, of course, it's round, so you no longer have those simple modes. We now have vessel functions with the modes. Okay, so, so because of that internal reflection, when we were talking about evanescent waves, you need to make the cladding thick enough so that you can you don't get any coupling between this fiber and another one near to it. So you can't put two fibers together because you'll get the telephone call or the data signal being transferred from one fiber to the other. 
and the buffer and the jacket that go around the outside are there to basically stop things from breaking. These are what are called.